This video is sponsored by Telltale's The Expanse. Assassin's Creed 1. If you've seen any of my other videos on the channel, you'll know that I've never played the first one. Out of some weird protection of my nostalgia starting with the second game and having Altair be a mythical person for me just as it was for other characters in the game. But we've got work to do and it's high time that I finally played the game that started the only franchise that could rival Call of Duty when it comes to the number of releases. And I don't know if that's a good thing, but to release a mainline game every year of this scale and quality when you're having two of them is impressive to say the least. The marketing leading up to the release of AC1 kept the modern day sections close to the chest. When we finally were greeted with this sort of unsettling menu screen and a dude in an hour time a day hoodie was a great surprise to those who didn't know any better at the time. And the great links Ubisoft went to create as immersive an experience as possible was and is amazing. More on this in a second. I do remember trying to play this game once when I was younger after playing two in Brotherhood. And what I remember is one, this game has some jank to it and we'll get into that. And more importantly too, these faceless women creep me out so much. And on that note, a lot of the modern day in this game and the other earlier titles had this amazing air of unnerving mystery. Notably the subject 16 wall and being just as confused as Desmond is as we go along this story. And he has increased knowledge, increased in sorrow. This warning about knowledge causing sorrow makes me love Ezio's decision at the end of his story even more to reject the apple and find contentment. I'm covering AC1 as AC Mirage is coming out soon and is bringing back the OG Assassin's Creed. And you know what else is back? Telltale! I know you know because how much we all love their Walking Dead series and even The Wolf Among Us. Deck Nine, known for another choice-based game I think you've heard about, Life is Strange, has teamed up with Telltale to bring a new narrative experience called The Expanse. We play as Carmina Drummer, the executive officer aboard the Artemis, a scavenging ship hunting for a big score in the outer regions of the belt. And in Telltale classic fashion, we've got to make tough choices all day long that decides everyone's fate. Just like The Walking Dead, anybody can live and anyone can die, and it's up to us to make those choices. The game is being released episodically every two weeks, meaning you can make alternate decisions and see the outcome before getting to the next episode. I've been hankering for some new choice based games lately, so this came at the perfect time. These kind of games are ripe for the channel, so I'm excited to dive into it because nobody does it better than Telltale. And also, the game just looks amazing. And also the music, I kept the game on the menu way too long before jumping in. But The Expanse is out on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC on the Epic Games Store, and it's available right now. So use my link in the description or pinned comment to purchase your copy of The Expanse and start being a scavenger today. I can't anchor him to the memory. Too much psychological trauma. He's rejecting the treatment, retreating. And right away, Ubisoft shows their hand. And I'll say, I wish I could experience it the first time like it was supposed to be. Ignorance is bliss. And this glitching of the Animus is an amazing hook for a game we expected to just be a typical action adventure in the Crusades. And since Desmond is rejecting the memory and the entire HUD is diegetic, we've got our tutorial messages glitching out too. We know who you are, what you are. I don't know what you're talking about. Nolan North is such a badass. I know it, you know it. There's just the slightest shred of failure in his lie that exposes him. Truth be told, the only reason you're still conscious is because this approach saves us time. Honesty. Horrible, twisted, but honesty. So what is it, Mr. Miles? Live or die? Make your choice. You're inside the Animus. Which is? It's a projector that renders genetic memories in three dimensions. So pretty much our future with VR. God, if this is real, the amount of things corporations and governments would do with this tech. Oh, yeah. That's the whole thought experiment behind the series. Good on you, Yubi. Which is the big reason why AC1 captured its audience. It had such a solid premise and gameplay that it was basically begging to get more funding for a sequel. Genetic memory. Seems you'll need a bit of a tutorial. Ha! People give Desmond shit for being an idiot, but what do you expect? Gives us someone to be out of the loop with. Genetic memory, if you will. Migration, hibernation, reproduction. How do animals know when and where to go? What to do? That's just animal instinct. Now you're arguing semantics, Mr. Miles. I love how Vidic makes a really great argument, which is somewhat proven with genetic memory. And the second Desmond gives another thought, he sidesteps it, making sure that his thoughts on the subject dominate. Would you say kind of like a Templar? Or you could argue even like an assassin, but then as Vidic put it, Now you're arguing semantics, Mr. Miles. As in all my AC videos, let's get it over with and move on. These are two sides of the same coin, and I never realized how much AC1 preached that, because subsequent games sometimes gets lost in the gray narrative and go more black and white with the conflict. It's resisting. We found similar reactions among patients who undergo hypnosis to relive traumatic events. Relating your fictional technology regarding memory to some real world play with memory. 
This is a fantastic way to get people on board with this whole new animus thing. It grounds the possibility of something like this existing and makes me more easily go, sure, why not? The synchronization bar represents how in sync you are with your ancestors' memories. I love everything about this tutorial and how it's all talking to Desmond and us at the same time. Plus Altair's health being synchronization rather means Altair never took a hit in his entire career as an assassin. And also is a great way to discourage behavior that Altair wouldn't have done such as killing civilians or I don't know, jumping off a roof to your death. Makes playing as Altair more immersive. Gives the ultimate, this is my avatar. That is also kind of me feeling that's also Desmond playing as another dude way back at the time that games are the king of. The Animus utilizes a puppeteering concept to control the actions of your ancestor. <laughs> it's basically like a fighting game and I love it. It's not just fluff either. It also applies in universe. It applies to our control scheme as well, which kind of blows my mind that each button really is attached to each body part and our controls stay so intuitive. Using your legs button in high profile will allow you to sprint. Legs button. <laughs> Only got to record one audio line for every platform. Pretty smart, GLaDOS. Yubi tried their best to make this an assassination game so hard. It's crazy that from the people that made Splinter Cell struggle to figure out stealth in a game called Assassin's Creed. To remedy this though, and to their defense, the social stealth is really where things shine and has always been a hallmark of the Assassin's Creed franchise. It's why I believe they never added a crouch button for so long. Ubisoft knew how to do this. They knew how impactful a crouch button would be, but never did until Unity. They wanted to push us into social stealth, to be one with the crowd and stalking our target on scene, or climbing up and using the rooftops like a bird of prey. More on the eagle imagery later. So we have a murderer nearby. The tutorial guards went to the Skyrim school of sussing out targets. <laughs> you can mimic a scholar and pass near soldiers without arousing suspicion. God, do I miss this in later games. This truly gave the feeling of being invisible among the crowds. Oh boy, did Eagle Vision start something in gaming. Or better put, did it pioneer something that Batman Arkham Asylum perfected? This mechanic has made itself indispensable in so many games to the point of player fatigue and annoyance. Which leads me to say it was an awesome mechanic that allows me to say my teenage years were defined by playing games in a blue filter because of it. And I am not mad about it. Following the Assassin's Creed. Woo, she said it. Welcome to the Animus, have a look around. All the memories of Altair can be found. There are assassins and Templars and traitors galore. Don't act surprised when Templars are actually kind of sympathetic and it's our headmaster who is the twist bad guy. This one need not die. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love our immediate intro to Altair's and complete contradiction to what we just learned about the creed. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Understand these words. It matters not how we complete our task, only that it's done. But this is not the way of- My way is better. Man, does Altair start so bullheaded, using the assassin's scripture to justify his actions. It's so human that you might say that you could see people in your real life do the exact same thing? Hmm? What? Crazy, right? Which works beautifully with the perversion of the Knights Templar, whom were a military order of Catholic faith. And you can make your decisions on how you fall about the Knights Templar. But now that faith is twisted in a way to enforce their own ideals of how the world ought to be. You'll see this as Robert Saab plays the holy war for both sides to make sure the Templars come out on top. The Ark of the Covenant? Don't be silly. There's no such thing. It's just a story. <laughs> I guess Altair isn't completely wrong. All the religions in this world were created to explain away the machinations of the Isu. I guess you could say that Altair is already proving how much of a master he is. Nah, he's just that one know it all from the lunch table that you really wish you could tell the F off, but he's the teacher's pet, Randall. Altair is Randall from Recess. Do not compromise the Brotherhood. I am your superior in both title and ability. You should know better than to question me. Okay, the story isn't subtle and I'll be honest. Doesn't have crazy character arcs and revelations, at least not to the scale that we're accustomed to, but it works. It works really well for establishing a new IP, especially for the time of release. Having Altair be such a little shit gives the game easy legs to form its foundation on. The Holy Land is lost to him and his. He should flee now while he has the chance. Stay. All of you will die. An option that Altair doesn't present some. Are we the bad guys? No, no, we can't be. We got the better drip. Our first parkour challenge. The free running in this game is what made it carve out its own identity in the industry at the time. The only other game really like it was previous Prince of Persia games, which is also a Ubisoft property and inspiration for this game. So Ubisoft nearly had a monopoly on movement this free flowing at the time, and it blew me away as a kid, and even still is so one of a kind in the way it feels. There are other games like Middle Earth and Dying Light, but nothing has ever felt as good as AC's system for it. More on this later once we reach Damascus. I'm kind of sad they gave this up in later games, but it's such a neat detail that Altair looks exactly like Desmond, down to the scar and everything. Realistic? No. 
Cool? Absolutely. Safety and peace out there. On you as well. What are these guys, Catholic? <laughs> God, that beautiful, unsettling, ethereal score from Jesper Kidd. A genius composer that has never missed, but is only missed in modern titles. He returns at last. A bass. Little did we know what this guy would become. And I bet neither did Yubi. Another word and I'll put my blade to your throat. There'll be plenty of time for that later. Hinting at the training yard or foreshadowing the final conflict. Robert threw me from the roof. There was no way back. Nothing I could do. Because you would not heed my warning. All of this could have been avoided. Altair never raises his voice. Always has this flat intonation. Makes everything he's saying even more dickish and it's perfect. On the other hand, it makes everything nice that he says even sweeter because of that flat tone. Even Altair's voice is a chameleon. For the keynote, you notice that the Ark has the same logo for the locked memory in the Animus. Show this fool knight what it is to have no fear. Go to God! The famous Leap of Faith was born. Faith that the Hay will save you. Faith in the headmaster of this strategy. Faith in the Creed. <laughs> this is like the one and only time you ever see a Leap of Faith, well, scripted ones, fail. I know for a fact y'all jumped off a building to your death way too many times thinking a little flower bed over there is going to save you. I've got to retroactively win Revelations for its opening Masyaf section, bringing the Altair and Ezio Saga to a perfect close, down to Ezio making the same jump and climbing up this exact same building together. Something I didn't totally grasp during the time having not played this before. To a more recent one. Even skipping forward in the story to save time has precedence in the Animus. Ubisoft really thought of everything. Worried that you'd listened in Solomon's temple, Altair. All of this would have been avoided. For all of Assassin's Creed faults, one thing has been consistent. Their undying research and dedication to telling an amazing slant history. So much truth is in these stories, and the actual history can be found in the databases. This love for history started right away, and is one of the many reasons I'll disagree when people say AC1 was a great proof of concept. I love Amalim having a milky eye. One where he could see his life as an assassin, and another clouded by his own greed and arrogance. Speaking of Amalim, he in pretty much the beginning of Assassin's Creed is based on the Hashashin, a group of actual assassins who ran around in the 12th century. If you want to know more about that and those connections, check out my Revelations video after this one. Getting to step out as Desmond does wonders for pacing, especially later on when we're on target 5 or 6, when the monotony of the gameplay loop is really starting to grade. We have nothing now, but we will. You just need to have a little faith. Like a leap of faith? Lucy foreshadowing, or am I thinking too hard? If we weren't sure about Vidic being the bad guy, he just stands over Desmond like a paranormal activity demon until he wakes. So, there you go. But fail to treat the source and, well, you're buying time at best. There's no true change to be had without comprehensive, systemic intervention. You know, Doc, you almost got me on the Templar side. And really, in this first one, the Templars seem to have a more realistic view of the world than the Assassins do. I mean, those monks dress up in robes, have a code they stick to, how do we in a mountain forcers to be trained and learn how to live? Sounds more like a cult. Whereas the Templars are out in the real world trying to make change for what they believe in. And isn't that what the assassins want? For everyone to have a choice? Isn't killing someone removing that choice? And now I find myself in that same boat I do in all my AC videos, trying to argue and understand the conflict, suss out who is right and wrong, and the answer is they both are and aren't. So get ready for AC Infinite because this shit's never gonna end. Notice Lucy still has your finger here. Remember that for later. Felt death's embrace. You saw what I wanted you to see. Well, how'd you manage that, Gramps? Giving us a mystery with our murder. It does not grant you the freedom to do as you wish. It is a knowledge meant to guide your senses. It expects a wisdom you clearly lack. And for Amalim to spout this as doctrine shows us just how much of a master Ezio was of the creed. The words are just an observation of reality. And I'll tell you, making these mistakes and living with the consequences is the entire point of the phrase that Amalim is now punishing for. Am I giving Altair a lot of grace? Yes, but the creed under Al-Malim isn't how it should be, and I love that we're set up to believe that this is the right way to follow the Brotherhood, only for the Templars to be killed to undress everything we've believed throughout. Al-Malim still has his ring finger. This was retconned in Revelations, likely to make Al-Malim's subterfuge more hidden and him appear more smart, but I enjoy it more as the preacher doesn't follow his own gospel and hence towards his true nature. So you'd have me take a life? No, not yet at least. For now you're to become a student once again. What a perfect way to naturally tutorialize every little bit about your game. It makes Altair even more of a master, purposely restraining himself like counter killing, since he hasn't achieved the proper rank to do such things. Way to make us feel hopeless. Lost, lost, lost. The Assassin have many tools at their disposal. Yes, yes. 
We can eavesdrop, we can pickpocket, or we can use violence to intimidate. Good, you remember. <laughs> Altair has no patience. Ezio has a lot in common with him than I ever realized, both getting served up their needed humble pie. I'm not a traitor. It's Al Mualim who's betrayed us. We should have listened. Altair, it seems my students do not fully understand what it is to wield the blade. Perhaps you could show them what you know. God, is this voice actor ingrained in my head from the Ezio trilogy. <laughs> Notice how Altair is still treated as the badass he is, regardless of rank. It's like Ahsoka coming back in Season 7, you know? Open worlds weren't a new thing at this point. Oblivion had just come out a year prior, so the kingdom doesn't stand out as anything special other than a nice change of pace from all the main urban environments. The choice to start this first game during the Crusades was an obvious one because of the Hashashin inspirations. Staying as close to that time period would ease every part of the workflow. And staying aligned with history, having downsized versions of these historic cities has always been a treat, especially for those who have lived or visited these cities. Being able to find Serugia in Damascus, the Amayyad Mosque, or even the Church of St. Anne in Jerusalem. It's something I think we've taken for granted in this series are these environments. I mean, fuck, Paris, Italy is one-to-one -one scale, which is insane. Even in 2023, the paired animations for combat are top tier. Having each attack be blocked realistically isn't something that's easily done in animation. A lot of work goes into this sort of thing to make it look clean like this. I miss things like this in future games. Now, it's just hiring some girls to distract the guards. This oozes that knife in the crowd feeling. Oh god. Oh no. The invention of the mechanic that will drive us nuts for the next 15 years. Seriously though, these viewpoints were amazing. To make our way through the sandbox of a city to the tippy top and see all around to then jump off safe and sound, I was addicted to climbing these and finding them all as a kid. Especially the ones that had some problem solving even, like the Giotto Bell Tower or Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Which brings me to continue the conversation about the parkour. Assassin's Creed started a system here that has never reached its potential. Unity was a promise of growth, but proved too difficult to make right. Now right there is a proof of concept. But what still makes it great is that though we're never seen just how far the system could go, the overwhelming amount of freedom and self-expression present in the system has never been replicated in this way still in other games. It'll always just feel great to climb around the sandbox of these cities, to have every surface on them be climbable, which is crazy when you think about where we were at in 2007. To create our own stories on how you escaped that one fight after an assassination, this sandbox is what pushed AC towards open world collectathons because it's just so ripe for it. Speaking of those chases, Assassin's Creed 1 does it better than any other AC game, not because of how smooth or scripted they are, but because you actually need to run away, especially early. This is before the killstreak system that trivialized combat. So when faced with more than say, five enemies, it could be tough. The difficulty influences the narrative of us being an assassin, needing to get in close quietly to secure a kill, then disappear once again. In later games, I would just kill all the guards because it's easier and faster than running, but AC1 was just built different. I failed to pickpocket here, and thank you Ubisoft for not forcing me to listen to the conversation again. I will always win developers respecting our time and sanity. It is not for me to question your ways. I am certain no matter how strange your approach to- Recognize that voice? I bet you do. That's Carlos Ferro, voice of Leonardo da Vinci later. It makes me happy to see a dev bring talent from game to game. <laughs> For a minute, I was going to talk about Alan Lee executing seemingly two people back to back and how awful that is, but his was done with respect to the old execution method called Hukuman Salang to drive a sword through the collarbone down through the heart. A clean death. Then a. This. For all the leeway I've given Templars this video, this don't paint them in a good light. Such pride. It will destroy you, child. It almost already has. A feather you use to show proof of the kill. Could be anybody's blood, sure, but it's a nice symbol of a job well done. And plays into all the eagle imagery of the assassin. The logo was inspired by the bottom side of an eagle's skull. Think of it as the last thing a prey sees as the eagle descends upon it. With how assassins stalk the rooftops, our apex predators, and quick and come out of nowhere, it's no wonder why they herald them in all their imagery. And this is where the peak of the hood was inspired, to hide one's face and pay homage to the eagle. And Altair's name literally translates to the flyer in Arabic. Notice how blown out the windows are. It really shows how in the trenches Desmond is. Barely ever seeing the sun, either asleep or in the animus. His poor little eyes don't get a chance to adjust. Isn't that what you assassins strive for? Peace in all things? Once again, someone from these orders cherry picking a statement to skew it to highlight their own argument. It's more of peace in all things, Vidic. I still don't see where I fit into things. Just give it like the fifth or third game, however you want to say it. And then you'll finally kind of know what's going on. Tamir spoke as if he knew you well. He implied my work had a larger meaning. A good twist always feels so obvious in retrospect, and Assassin's Creed 1 did it very well. I never suspected Amelie. 
or at least wouldn't have upon a first playthrough. So this is when the game really opens up and just lets us go out and explore. It's fun for the first while to just figure things out and bubble around until we find our next objective. And I can appreciate the lag of hand holding on which tower to climb and which city to do first. You know, the air generally was ahead of its time, but then you get things like this and I can't help but enjoy it. Harmless bugs like this are what makes games so fun. You're never gonna be watching a Chris Nolan film and just see a stranger walking in place or a book with a random line of text in between dialogue. Emergence. It's what makes games so special, and the first reason I go to to explain why I love gaming to people who don't understand it. I ask that you perform some menial task in an effort to redeem yourself. So be out with it. Very well. It's fresh to see someone walk up and talk to Altair in this manner. He's revered as some god in later games, but he really is just a dude at the end of the day. Step into the light, then, and I will grant you one final favor. I like to think canonically all the shadows in these games are much darker than what we really see. Having Altair step into the light exposing himself has much more weight if so. And it's deeply symbolic of the work in the dark to serve the light. Now I stand before you. What is it you desire? You can't fault him and you kind of got to respect him for wanting to see his pursuer face to face before discussing with him. The Brotherhood is not so weak that my death will stop its work. The f***s even use the same terminology. Beggars, whores, addicts, lepers. Do they strike you as proper slaves? Unfit for even the most menial tasks? No. I took them not to sell, but to save. Is he telling the truth? Why would someone inside be begging for us to help them? Guy's got a funny definition of the word save. Talal is dead. Oh, I know, I know. In fact, the entire city knows! Have you forgotten the meaning of subtlety? Altair, for all his ability, never really changes much throughout when it comes to his views of the creed. His arc is more of rebuilding his reputation and learning more about the Templars and unveiling Amelie. Also, yes, he does drop the ego about the creed, but his personality doesn't change. Nothing like Ezio the playboy to Ezio the wise. By the end, he's still himself. Same confidence, same stalwart beliefs, and I respect that. They are the ones who speak and act as if there is nothing wrong. I don't understand. To that end, Altair does learn a bit of patience and realizing that maybe he should look before he leaves. But still, that's not some monumental shift in character. I saw them, though. The men and women who would be slaves. They were a strange sort. Old, mad, sick. Explains away the man screaming for help. Weak, yes. What better way to make a soldier than to take a broken man and rebuild him? Give him all he's been denied with the promise of more. Um, isn't that exactly what you did with Altair, friendo? Upon reaching Acre is whenever you really start to see the differences between the cities. Not as drastic as Florence from Tuscany from Venice, my personal favorite city variety in a game, by the way. We get to Acre, the rundown, bogged town city. Then there's the golden rays of Damascus and the in-betweener of Jerusalem. Gives each city its own identity because without this color palette, each city would just feel the same. You want to go crazy? Go collect all the flags in each area. To those of you that did it without a guide, thank you for your service. I get a childlike joy out of these pickpockets. Watching them immediately be like, what the f***? While we're right there. Do you think this gives me pleasure? Do you think I want to hurt you? But you leave me no choice. I bet that was the exact same thing that Yosef Mengele said to his victims. Feel to be whole again. I, I don't know how you did it. <laughs> it wasn't easy, I assure. <laughs> right as I'm plunging my blade into his back, homeboy is being commended and helping this guy. I guess you gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. <laughs> Do you appease a kind child simply because he wails? But I want to play with fire, father. What would you say? As you wish. Ah. But then you'd answer for his burn. Then he directly talks about his work being slowed after losing the Apple of Eden. The very thing that made God cast out Adam and Eve for taking and no longer caring for them to keep fire from them. This isn't news to anyone, but the Templars want to play God. At least for altruistic purposes, it seems. We don't invent them. We find them. Find them. Their gifts, Mr. Miles, from those who came before. Ubisoft really had so much set up for this world. These gifts and technological breakthroughs are all coming from the Templars using the Isu's tech to promote a better world. Crazy to think now where the story is and how it all started. The men who pretend to govern in their absence. Give me names and I'll give you blood. So I will. Almaline gives us a name in each city for us to tackle in whatever order we want. Here is where the gameplay loop really starts to buckle under the monotony. With not enough story to back it up. It's here where I believe most people call this game a proof of concept. Too long and seeming to be engaging, story too simple with it being arrogant boy gets humbled, bad guys aren't as bad as they seem, our master betrays us. And to top it all off, the gameplay feels like a skeleton of something greater. All these points have merit, but they're always talked about alone to support that argument. 
AC1 is greater than the sum of its parts. When you get into a flow of just exploring, tracking, fighting, escaping, it can be a real joy. More so, if this is the first game you played in the series, this is a complete game. And to say anything less so, leads me to believe that those are comparing it to the future titles. I can assure you that no one in 2007 was like, it was good, but it feels like a playtest of a game that's not quite ready yet. Nostalgia has not been kind to AC1, but it's a blast to play a game from the beginning of the seventh generation. We get baby's first ever and only side objective in AC1 by saving civilians. It's basically nothing, but it's something to do other than the main story, and was a predecessor to recruiting assassins later, using the same symbol for it too, which is a nice callback. I envy you, Altair. Well, not the bit where you were beaten and stripped of your rank, but I envy everything else. Oh, except for the terrible things the other assassins say about you. Okay, Rafik is just a predecessor to Leonardo at this point, in voice, mannerisms, and dialogue. He's a great treat to come across versus bitter stumpy over there. The dialogue which we'd expect cutscenes for nowadays is so unengaging. This is true, most likely down to the time and budget constraints. So the bandit fix that was kind of clever only because it gave us something to do was allow us to change the camera angles and give us glitches to promote us to do so. Looking back 16 years later, it's almost charming. Yes. William of Montferrat is my target. Every target we are sent after in AC1 are real figures who had died during the time or went missing. A trend set here that we will find become increasingly common with how the assassins were actually responsible for the demise in later games. Where would you have me begin my search? What's this? You're actually asking for my assistance instead of demanding it. I'm impressed. Be out with it. As you wish. Ha! <laughs> Stumpy spoke too soon! I need to see William. I never said he needs to see me. Okay, that's pretty badass, Altair. There's one last thing I need from you. What is it? Your life. The best puzzle viewpoint in AC1. Took me a while to figure out how to get on the top of here, but oh, was it such a payoff. William's death in the game is actually inspired by real life William's son, Conrad's death, who was actually killed by assassins. I know that you are going to murder Richard and claim Akla for your son, Conrad. <laughs> for Conrad. Funny because it said that one of the assassins who killed Conrad was tortured and said that Richard sent the attackers. For Conrad, my son is an arse, unfit to lead his host, let alone a kingdom. Probably still upset about that one time Conrad aimed a crossbow at him to call an executioner's bluff. Also, probably talking about his failed attack on the Tower of Flies. Ubisoft informing one bit of dialogue off of recorded history is just so cool. Stole their food? No, I took possession so that when the lean times came, it might be rationed properly. And as for the conscription, they were not being trained to fight. They were being taught the merits of order and discipline. Much of what he says sounds like the modern day for us in real life. Did the Templars win in our timeline? But as an assassin, it is your nature to notice, to question. Then what is it that connects these men? Ah, but as an assassin, it is also your duty to steal these thoughts and trust in your master. Dude is just straight up Palpatine with these words. Maybe 23 year old me would have seen this coming, but definitely not 12 year old me whenever I played AC2 for the first time. For there can be no true peace without order, and order requires authority. What do you say? <laughs> Why? Is he afraid? Not fear, hate. He hates himself as much as he hates the people he pretends to serve. Yeah, the Merchant King's issues seem to track with a lot of rich and powerful people. When he doesn't buy happiness all that, so they lash out to feel something. He can't stay hidden forever. No. Those celebrations of his. He comes out to speak. To look down upon the people. A sense of belonging, I suppose. You think? I actually really enjoy the irony because he's doing exactly the opposite and is looking down on them. Like, look at these f poor pieces of sh**. Dude literally thinks he's Jesus, turning water into wine. I guess that's another thing that tracks with the rich god complexes. Can we start eating it? Compassion. Mercy. Tolerance. These words mean nothing to any of you. Enough! I pledge myself to another cause. One that will bring about a new world. Was it just making snap judgments about the Merchant King from an outsider's perspective, just like Altair? Yes. But it's more fun that way. Dude's actually doing exactly what I just asked, eating the rich. So can I be a Templar now? Can I get a cool ring and have my dad understand me for once in my life? Ironic, our man turns water into wine and kills a set of hills. <laughs> what the f*** is that run? And why is Big Boy outpacing us? Templars are definitely not natty like us assassins. Strong in the conviction that their death will improve the lots of those left behind. A minor evil for a greater good. We are the same. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all get it. You and I are not so different. <laughs> I've yet to mention along with the paired animations, the ones for the counter kills also look freaking amazing. So smooth and saucy, I feel like I should win it for something. I'm the one who does the killing. 
If you want it to continue, you'll speak straight with me for once. Tell him, boy! Not lost. Taken. By you. And then you've sent me to fetch it again like some damn dog. It seems I'll need to find another. A shame. You showed great potential. I think if you had another, you'd have sent him long ago. Damn, am I in love with this exchange. It is ripe. Now imagine this scene with proper blocking, camera work, and performance capture. This would be a highlight in the game. Another reason people rag on this is proof of concept. Non novis, domine non novis. Templars. Just as the role of the Templars has revealed itself to you, so too will the nature of their treasure. Amalim is a master manipulator. He makes it feel like Altair figured out the Templars when Al just told him, which in turn deflects Altair's desire to know more about the treasure. I am not a novice. A man's skill is defined by his actions, not the markings on his robe. Something many of us are too quick to forget. I can't be the only one who has done this, right? The gambler! The heretic! Funny they think he's talking about casting out God, but we know better now. Of course not. I killed them because I could. Because it was fun. Do you know what it feels like to determine another man's fate? Finally, someone who's just a bad dude. Morally Grey is only interesting for so long, and sometimes you just need a little crackpot of a guy to shake things up. It's why we love Sauron or the High Evolutionary from Guardians of the Galaxy 3. That little fight your ancestors started during the Third Crusade? It never ended. You're being held by Templars. Vidic's a Templar? This is when the modern day really started getting interesting. And about that, Lucy, I think you've got your timelines wrong. And I'm still holding on hope that one day they create an entire game in the modern day. Though I know that doesn't have the same sex appeal as ancient Greece, Egypt, Petty. The answers to all of your questions are right in front of you. You just have to know where to look. Ugh, now Lucy is even talking cryptic like a Templar. We should have seen it coming the whole time. Here are the places where you should focus your search. On the docks east of here, among the ships and their crews. At the chapel to the northeast, near the cross overlooking the port. I feel so dumb. I did listen to where the viewpoints were to our finer investigations and ended up doing, like, all of them every time. I commend the game for trusting the player to listen and remember, but I'm still a little bitter. The men I've killed, they are all connected. Al Muallam warned me that word of my deeds has spread among them. A really natural way of increasing the difficulty of these last few targets. Not just bloated, stronger enemies, but more realistic protection, more men, higher walls. Forces us to consider our approach more. Or perhaps they do not know you because you are not a man of God, but an assassin! Never! We don't see the psychological effects of assassins often. If you think about it from their perspective, their dudes are just dropping like flies without a soul to be seen carrying out the deed. At least canonically. Which has got to do wonders for one's mental state. If you truly are a man of God, then truly the Creator will provide for you! Let him stay my hand! You've gone mad! See what I mean about Altair's personality not really changing? Just a bit of a perspective shift. He's still a man that wants to get a job done. Not some altruistic savior he's heralded as later yet. Boy, he's just standing there like... A small price to pay. Control men's minds. Murdered any who spoke against you. I followed my orders. Believing in my cause. Good soldiers follow orders. Misguided, perhaps, but pure in motive. I am but a Rafiq, Altair, and such things are beyond me. <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. I am but a Cameron, and I don't know sh and it is quick to replace that which is severed, then we should lop off its head and be done with this. Soon. Soon. Sounds like Altair doesn't understand how to kill a Hydra. It's great symbolism, though, as this conflict will never end. One which we can either submit to, as most do, or transcend. What is it to transcend? To recognize nothing is true and everything is permitted. That laws arise not from divinity, but reason. I understand now that our creed does not command us to be free. It commands us to be wise. I think this is why Assassin's Creed has resonated with so many people. Not just because of its parkour combat mechanics, because it strikes at an intrinsic truth that we all understand at a base level, whether we realize it or not. The world around us, everything we've built is an illusion. Truly. Not just some made-up mumbo for a cool game. Society is fragile, and the walls we've built and structures we've created around us to give our lives meaning, even more so. It's why I love the trope of a brilliant man who saves the world and just becomes a lowly farmer. It's not out of fear or hubris that he does this, but understanding of the world and what really matters. A full belly, shelter, and someone to love and be loved by. It sounds so obvious, simple, and even kind of stupid when you hear it, but so often we forget. It's nice to have a reminder that many of our woes are self-fabricated, and sometimes we need to transcend and shed our egos a little bit and embrace life more earnestly. All that came from a silly little scene in the game, and if that's too silly and try hard to sound smart on some video, that's cool. But to me, 
it was a really nice reminder about the nature and fragility of this life we have and not to take it for granted. July was pretty rough for me, friends. Anyway, Assassin's Creed will always be among one of my favorite franchises because of this true-to-life nature of wearing it on its sleeve. To make the final target absolutely hard as nails, our notoriety has gone up so much that even just walking past guards is enough to aggro them. They are beacons meant to guide us, to save us from the darkness that is ignorance. No, these bits of paper are covered in lies. They poison your minds. Fun to have all these guys dressed the same, to make us believe the Templar is the ignorant one wanting to pull a Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> JK, we should get another straight up baddie Templar and I just wanted to make a Fahrenheit joke. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Yes, exactly. It's part of what makes the Animus so spectacular. There's no room for misinterpretation. There's always room. A little hint of Desmond's assassin's color showing. I'll be quick as I can. Stay safe, my friend. Oh, he said my friend. We've made it, guys. We've done the character arc. I do not accept your apology. I understand. No, you don't. I do not accept your apology because you are not the same man who went with me into Solomon's temple. And so you have nothing to apologize for. Oh, reverse card. Damn. And love how Altair just takes it, Grace. More people should learn from this. For it seems one stands among us. He mocks us with his presence and must be made to pay. Seize him. Good on the Templars for finally figuring out how to spot an assassin because like, it's not that hard. These dudes stand out like a sore thumb. Which is why I love the Assassin's Creed multiplayer. You really never knew who was trying to kill you. God. You player and I can't wait for their future game. Not nine, eight. What do you mean? You are not my target. I will not take your life. You're free to go. It only took about eight heralds murdered and a pretty face for Altair to learn this lesson. Stop hiding behind words, Malik. You wield the creed and its tenants like some shield. He's keeping things from us, important things. You were the one told me we could never know anything, only suspect. Well, I suspect this business with the Templars goes deeper. This is why I said Altair's arc isn't a complete 180 of his character. When he believes himself right, he believes it. Boy, did they not make this final boss run easy, throwing the entire kitchen sink at us. I joke that I'm bad at video games all the time, but I think I'm actually decent, and this was rough. My concern is for the people of the Holy Land. If I must sacrifice myself for there to be peace, so be it. This is a strange place we find ourselves in. Indeed. It feels like two brothers fighting for Dad's approval. Then who? The Lord. Let this be decided by combat. Oh yeah, a one-on-one -on -one for the final battle. I f guess so. Killing a small platoon is even more impressive than just one man, so whatever. Who? It is your master, Al-Mualim. But he is not a Templar. Did you never wonder how it is he knew so much? What do you want me to do? Just try and have a little faith. Your. I told you to remember. She had only recently chopped her finger for Project Siren, seeing Desmond's dismay and the assassin's effort to rescue him. Lucy was a Trojan horse, and her losing a finger on the last day is a big red flag to her true nature. She isn't allowed to leave, same as Desmond, so the ritual couldn't have happened. Moreover, the cutting of the finger was dropped hundreds of years ago, something that Abstergo obviously didn't know, or did Ubisoft because all these wins are only possible because of future games change the context, but I'm still gonna win it. And yes, I know Project Siren only exists because actor Christian Bell wanted more pay, so they fired and killed her character. Gone to see the master. Was it the Templars? Did they attack again? They walk the path. What path? What are you talking about? Fun topsy-turvy camera work to show the Apple's effects. More proof that Altair didn't change too much. Just straight up killing his assassin homies before understanding it's not their choice. Unlike later when he doesn't. Altair! Up here! Gotta love our boy going from foe to adversary to bestie. The men we face. Their minds are not their own. If you can avoid killing them. <laughs> I told you it would be later when Eddie grows. I just didn't give you a timeline. I found proof. Proof of what? That nothing is true. And everything is permitted. By the end of the game, Altair and Amalim swap roles. Now it's he who is using the Creed's words to justify his own actions and Altair piercing the veil. Fighting all the targets at once is pretty damn cool and symbolic that all it takes is one man to sometimes to withstand an entire regime. You could also say the lack of camera work is just a symptom of the Animus, only being able to display these scenes like this with it being a 1.0 version. Granted, you could just say that anything that's a problem in the game is just because of the Animus, so good job Yubi having an end universe shield from all criticism. <laughs> now Malim turns himself into Nine, 
like the nine ring wraiths corrupted by desire, like the nine circles of hell, which I was going to connect each Templar targets to, but only about six of them worked with it, so I dropped the whole idea. But they were so close! <sighs> but the truth is, I did try. In my study, when I showed you the treasure. Huh. I was wondering why he was just waving it around willy-nilly. You saw through the illusion. It seems that Amalim's teachings weren't the worst. That's all he ever wanted Altair to do. I will miss you, Altair. You were my very best student. Well, that was a little anticlimactic, but makes sense. Dude is old, so it checks out. Check that. Even in his final moments, he's still obsessed with his trinket. So it seems. One last time, Altair tells Amali in the Assassin's Creed. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. Calling back to what the doctor told him. Interesting that Altair wants to root out the source of desire, then control those desiring it. Destroy it! Destroy it as you said you would! I... I can't. Altair is incapable of destroying the apple, which is indicative of our true human nature, that we will always live with temptation, desire, greed, love, hate, all these things that make us human. Remove any one of those and we cease to not be what we are anymore. Here's the first half of the sequel bait. All different locations that we will eventually see future AC games take place. Something tells me Ubisoft took this map as a challenge to be like, we gotta make a game on every dot. This is when the game gets really creepy. There was so much on this wall to get into that I don't have the time here, and also because I've already done so over on my AC2 video, which is already out, so I recommend you check that out if you want to see my thoughts on this wall. But needless to say, it gave us a lot to speculate about in the lead up to a sequel. And the game just kind of ends. Either they ran out of budget or just really wanted to wait for a sequel to expand the story. Either way, I'm glad they did. AC2 is one of my top games of all time. Assassin's Creed 1, on the other hand, is definitely my least favorite of the series, especially coming back to play it after having played most of the rest. It hasn't aged wonderfully, mostly in aspects of story and polish, but that's not a dig at the game. AC1 laid the perfect foundation for the next 10 years of Assassin's Creed games would benefit from. You see its DNA throughout every single one. Like stated before, no single aspect of the game stands out, so it's everything together that makes this thing great. But with one caveat, the parkour was revolutionary and shouldn't be forgotten without a bit of praise. So, uh, Sean, ring the ding! The story, on the other hand, wasn't anything mind-blowing when it came to characters, but what it did have going for it was its thought-provoking factions and ideologies that not many games at the time offered players. How old were you when you first played AC1? And while we're at it, AC2. I'm curious. I played two when I was 12 and one as a 23-year-old. So let me know down below. And remember, grab the speed limit, drink some water, and love one another. Beats babies. Thank you.